I try to get through all of Dead Rising 2 without taking any damage. As long as those boxes in the top left corner stay yellow, I'm good. But I can't just sit around in the safe house. I need to run around the mall and take out every psychopath in Fortune City, make sure my precious 84 month old sperm has enough Zombrex and get the perfect ending. Chuck Green, professional motocrosser, mechanic and dead wife haver, finds himself performing adult entertainment to earn money to keep his dying child alive. But despite killing more zombies than Frank West in the maintenance tunnels of Willamette Mall, the money he earns is now worth less than his daughter's terrible life as we find ourselves in the midst of a zombie outbreak. No. We've, we've got weapons here that we can play around with. Let's just yeet that over there and kill that. I think keeping my distance is definitely going to be the best tactic here. But what are the odds on just running past them? No! Woo! I hit him before he hit me. Oh my god, I didn't take damage. Let's go! We find Katie, force her out of the closet, which I don't know, it feels like it should have been her news to break, but there we go, and make our way to the safe house, where we are introduced to Paul Blart and Greater Thunberg. Despite Katie being in the safe house, she's still a ticking time bomb unless we get her some Zombrex. But before we do that, we need one thing. With an arsenal the same size of the Icelandic military stored in my back pocket, we make our way to the pharmacy, but when I ask for the Zombrex, they offer to beat the hell out of me. That's that, sorted. We introduce ourselves to... D Nice! ...and find out she's not just any survivor. With the call sign The Harmacist, D Nice is a well-trained mercenary, and with her trusty shotgun, codenamed The Painkiller, she can take out even the toughest of enemies. Dean Ice lets us take the Zombrex and we make our way back to the safe house, where we forcefully medicate Katie, which is when tragedy strikes. Just as I was having my perfect temperature cup of Earl Grey tea, that's grey with an E, and that's it, nothing even remotely controversial is said in the next line. <coughs> Something shocking comes on the news. A reporter shows video proof of me starting the outbreak, at least it looks like me. They have the same suit, body type, fat ass dumpy as me. Suddenly I'm a criminal. And here's me thinking I was only ever guilty of having juicy buttocks. This isn't right. I have to clear my name. But first, let's kill someone with an unspecified mental disability. On the way out of the safe house, we recruit Gordon and LaChandra to our private militia. Accompanied by the harm assist, Gordon with your and LaShore to break your legs, surely nothing can get in our way. I mean, unless of course my army will willingly beat up zombies, but when it comes to a living human being, they decide that I'm crazy and need to seek medical help as they stand there and do nothing. But no, that would never happen. Son of a <gasps> No! After discovering my army had made the decision to beat less meat than a Buddhist monk, we try this again and treat Ted like old yeller as we take him round the back and shoot him. Now the only thing we have to worry about is Snowflake, a murderous Bengal tiger. Our two options here were either to feed the tiger and get her to join us as a survivor, or murder an endangered animal. At first, I tried taming the wild beast, anything to keep my daughter happy before her inevitable demise. But after each attempt, I saw that becoming less and less of a possibility. Snowflake was costing me so many runs, and it got to the point where I was asking, is my daughter even worth it? Until I eventually decided. No! Katie can suck a fat one. She does nothing but sit on that couch and cry for three days. She doesn't need a tiger, she has a PSP for Christ's sake. Get some Lego Star Wars in there and have the time of your life. So yeah, we, we killed the tiger. Yes! <laughs> We've killed the tiger, people! We've done it! Right, get me to a save point. My god almighty. Don't take full... Dear Lord, that's the loudest profanity I've ever heard. Okay, a few attempts later, with a bit more skill, and an insane amount of luck, we managed to kill the tiger again. Right, Kitty is dead. Kitty? Back to the matter at hand, I'm still being framed for domestic terrorism, so we make our way to the Fortune City Hotel, but Rebecca's nowhere to be seen. Oh, sh a zombie! Now that Rebecca has saved our lives and we are eternally grateful, 
We mansplain to her that we're innocent and need to speak to her sources. While she's not too convinced to begin with, no one can withhold themselves from traditional British charm. Mate love? Was it mate love? Carly! Mate love? Where's my f***ing change? And with that, Rebecca starts using her journalistic abilities for good, breaking us into the security room, which is clearly not very secure. With our name cleared, we have a bit of time to spare before our next case, so we use this time to play some relaxing golf and very carefully recruit some survivors. And I say recruit and not save because, well, thank you very much, you can die there. Not long after, we get to Leon, the guy that mocked me for having a dead wife. How was I going to defeat him? If I shoot him, surely he just drives away, but if I get too close, I could get put on the next train to the Paralympics. But then I remembered. Never underestimate someone's stupidity. You are made of stupid. Leon just sat there, taking shots to the face like the professional he is, and not long after, I left him like Chuck's wife. Cremated. But there's no time for Chuck to rest. Just as we take out Leon, we get a call for a survivor from the Cure organization in the Americana Casino. But when we get there, the only thing he wants to cure is my depression and not in the I'll pay for your therapy sort of way. I didn't want to hurt Brandon. He was clearly going through some mental health issues and I wanted to help. But every time any of his friends, me, Stuart or Brittany tried to get close, he would just push us away. And with Vicky's life at risk, we couldn't take any chances. I didn't have the guts to do what needed to be done. So Brittany and Stuart volunteered to take out Brandon whilst I stood outside. But as I was watching my friends get butchered, I couldn't just let them die. So I finally stepped up and took out Brendan myself. With Brendan out of the way, we recruit Vicky and get her off the men's bathroom floor. God, I bet that was Sticky. Huh. Sticky Vicky. What an innocent name. Maybe you should Google that. Eventually, Stacy tells us she's seen something suspicious in the maintenance tunnels, and she was right. When we get down there, we find TK leading a group of mercenaries, and to make it worse, They've pulled out an Uno reverse and copied me. These mercenaries have fully automatic assault rifles. Identity theft is not a joke, Jim. Millions of families suffer every year. What these enemies weren't prepared for, however, is the unrivaled firepower of the light machine gun. The LMG is an unbelievably impressive complement of weaponry, and this death machine cuts through mercenaries like Obi-Wan cuts through Darth Maul. This opens up a bit of time for us before the next mission, so we make our way around them all, doing God's work and saving every survivor, not Jared, until eventually we come across Antoine. Antoine is a psychotic nut job. How dare you! I'm Antoine! I am the king of cuisine! Damn, my bad. Antoine is the king of cuisine and a psychotic nut job, very similar to Gordon Ramsay. Antoine is one of the most formidable opponents so far, with ranged attacks, fast movement speed, and the ability to heal during the battle. And on top of that, this fat can eat shots like he does food. There was no way I was going to be able to do this on my own, which is where Kevin comes in. Kevin was willing to go into this battle and sacrifice himself so we could live. So each time he died, it was only right that we restarted, mainly because we also took damage, but minor details. But finally, Kevin comes into his own, realising Antoine is the only thing between him and his favourite thing, snacks. It took some time, but with Kevin's unwavering support, we finally put enough bullets into Antoine to take him down. By the time we defeated Antoine, case 3 has started, but more importantly, we've reached the milestone of a thousand kills, a majority of which are with firearms, and to commemorate this, we did what felt right. Dress as an American policeman. At this point, TK's goons are ravishing them all and stealing money from the casinos, which is apparently our problem. I'm not really sure why. I mean, I get we don't like TK, but this isn't my money. I don't give a shit. Anyway, these goons have more guns than Mr. Webley, which, as you can imagine, can cause a few issues when you're trying not to take damage. Off? As if you've hit that. Sucking mum. It took a few attempts, but after changing tactics and picking up some new weapons, we finally managed to destroy the drill. Now just to do that three more times. Let's do it again. I wasn't 
looking. After forcing this completely natural situation Rebecca and I find ourselves in, she lets us know that we can meet her source. But before we can do that, we now have the unfortunate task of murdering a children's toy store mascot. Slappy, fittingly named as Hill, slap you across the face like a little has lost his mind after a girl he was going to go on a first date with died in the zombie outbreak. Which might sound cute and thoughtful, but do you know who else went on lots of first dates? That's right, Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh, first dates aren't enough evidence for you? Well, let's take a look at the Dead Rising 2 wiki, shall we? Slappy stalks around the mall. Do you know who else stalked people? Jeffrey Goddamn Dharma. Because he, just like Slappy, is a massive, filthy pervert. And that's why I have no remorse when I fill Slappy with more holes than the plot of Friends. It wasn't easy, especially as Slappy kept cooking me with his flamethrower, just like Jeffrey Dharma cooked his victims. But we eventually did the world a favour and took out this potential killer. But there ain't no rest for the wicked, as just as Slappy goes down, we get the call for Randy. Randy is another psychopath and another predator, as he's trying to force Danny into what I can only imagine is going to be a marriage that is riddled with domestic violence. Awkwardly though, Randy and I do appear to have the same bed and wardrobe. Despite having the build of Kevin James, Randy has the speed of Usain Bolt and with his massive pink chainsaw, which he does helicopters with, and no, I do not mean his penis, he is very easily able to mutilate our bodies. It became abundantly clear to me that with Randy's speed and his weapon size, we wouldn't be able to move away from his attacks or use the cover in the chapel, which led to 45 minutes of curating the perfect plan to take out Randy. We first head into the Palisades Mall and go to the high noon shooting range to restock on weapons. From there, we go to Lee's Fine Liquor, where we turn into my mum on the weekend as we pick up six bottles of wine. We head downstairs to the bar where we mix the six wines and create three quick steps. We then head to the Yucatan where we pick up two LMGs before heading back to the Silver Strip and absolutely obliterating Randy on the first attempt with the new tactic. Oh, he's run out of stamina. Yes, you fat <laughs> Come on. Come on, Randy, you I didn't think I'd have to put this much thought into killing a fat man in a gimp costume, I'm going to be honest. Randy out of the way, we now have a bit of time before the next case. So we're going to use that time to ask you to subscribe to the channel and like the video. Be sure to turn on notifications so you're notified for future uploads. New subscribers Danny, Luz and Janus by our side, it's now time to meet up with Rebecca's source. Once we get to the club, we discover Rebecca's source is the twins, Amber and Crystal, who are employed by TK. Much to my horror, the sacrifices I'd gathered for this battle apparently don't come into the room with me, so unfortunately, my first threesome experience ends with me getting shafted. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Surprisingly though, if you just walk backwards whilst shooting, Amber just backflips and completely misses you whilst you blast her in the face. Oh, and then Crystal killed herself. With the twins dealt with, Rebecca lets us know that TK plans on escaping Fortune City on a helicopter. But we don't know where yet, so in the meantime, we get to take on the fourth consecutive boss battle. I, I don't know what to tell you. I really wish I could fill some gaps here, but literally nothing happened between these fights. Our next boss fight is against Carl, a United States Postal Service worker who's gone insane, since he can no longer do his job. Which, I don't know, honestly it sounds like a dream, but each to their own. The United States Postal Service is a federal agency, so Carl could put us in a lot of... Sorry, I'm having trouble reading my script. I think it says danger? It's actually pronounced donger. Well, that's unfortunate. Upon discovering who I am, Carl hands me a time bomb that he just so happens to be carrying around, which is due to imminently explode. Carl, that kills people! Whilst my battle bots didn't do too much in the Amber and Crystal battle, they made up for it here, as they distract Carl long enough for me to get into cover and then proceed to fill him with lead. Oh, it's just too easy. This leaves us with 18 in-game hours before the next case, so we have an abundance of time to complete some tasks around the mall. Or we can waste all of our time and money gambling against people in the Atlantica Casino. The only problem with this is, I have no idea how to play poker, and a complete inability to learn from my mistakes, which led to me losing $110,000 to a man named after a state in which people openly assault judges. After losing $200,000 in total, we decide to leave the overweight gambling addict to die a slow and painful death, and instead we pay the small price of $10,000 to recruit three hookers. 
Which raises the question, why on earth do we need survivors? And the answer to that is Seymour. Seymour. Where's the transition? F Seymour. Yeah, so Seymour wasn't spawning for me. In Dead Rising games, you're allowed a maximum of eight survivors to be alive on the map at any one time. At this point, we had Cora, Summer, and Nina in our party. The gamblers, Nevada, Jessica, and Jacob, alive in the Atlantica, and Richard the Fatty in the Platinum Strip, bringing the total to seven. Seymour has a survivor with him, Ray, which would bring this to eight, and therefore the mission should start, but it never did. Long story short, we killed Richard and the mission spawned. Oh wait, is that? Hey, perfect, right, bye Richard, have a nice time. Bye, have a great time. Seymour is the mall security guard, and since the outbreak has taken his job way too seriously. Not by stopping you from having a drink in the mall, but by executing survivors. May I see it? No. But you can't polish a turd and a mall security guard is still just a mall security guard. So we sprint to the toilets of the South Plaza and let Nina and Summer do their thing. Which I initially thought was seduction and escorting, but I was very wrong. You see, what I did not realise was these girls are not women of the night, but actually paid bodyguards who proceed to beat the hell out of and kill Seymour. Did they kill him? <laughs> they killed him! Let's go! Nina and Summer, you're popping off, man. Unfortunately, that's not the end of our battle against gun-wielding nutjobs, as just as Seymour goes down, a group of crazed gunmen spawn in the Silver Strip. Get armor. Yeah, not a crazed gunman, Dad. I'm an assassin. What a difference be, and one has a job and the other's mental sickness. The mentally ill militiamen consisting of Big Earl, Johnny, Derek, and Dietz, or as we called them on stream, Dietz Nerds, ha! Got him! occupy each of the rooftops looking over the Silver Strip, and with their pinpoint accuracy can easily snipe you from across the map. But you can't hit what you can't see. So we use Chuck being right-handed to our benefit and peek every possible corner to take out the snipers without being hit. But before we could save, everything goes wrong. No, you f I have a question for God. Why? A few attempts later, we change positions and manage to take out Dietz once again. Oh, Ray. You know what, Ray? I will help. There you go. I'm helping, Ray. I'm putting you out of this miserable, miserable world. Just, you know, there you go, Ray. Th this is for the greater good. Okay. Once again, we have a bit of time before the next mission, so we make our way around the map murdering Europa, Woodrow, Randolph, Bill and Dean, before falling into a midlife crisis of gambling our life savings and buying a sports car. I am never going to financially recover from this. Which brings us to BB. If you take damage or fail during BB, you should just uninstall your game. We save BB from the zombies and escort her and the other survivors to the safe house where Rebecca meets us on the rooftop and we notice TK's helicopter landing on top of the hotel. Despite taking out Crystal and Amber, we still need to clear our name and prove to the world that I'm not responsible for the zombie outbreak. But this wasn't going to be easy. And here's Patrick Stewart to tell you why. An Apache helicopter has machine guns and missiles. It is an unbelievably impressive complement of weaponry, an absolute death machine. Okay, I know it's not an Apache helicopter, but this is close enough. As you can imagine, it can be quite difficult to avoid being shot with a minigun turret or turned into mincemeat by being hit by propeller blades, both of which, funnily enough, deal damage. Who'd have thought? This took many attempts, trying with different items from pylons to military cases to metal barricades to embarrassingly just missing the massive helicopter entirely, until finally I heard a voice in the distance. At first faintly, but getting louder and louder as the helicopter's health got lower and lower. And there it was, my way out. Give me the stupid club. The golf club can win us this battle. Look at how little health he has here. I don't know if this is doing damage. <laughs> send him home, just send him home. Time to go home there, ball. Oh my god, as if I've taken that out with a last golf ball. That's insane. With TK defeated and in our custody, we return him to the safe house where our only goal is to now wait for the military to arrive and get us out of Fortune City. But wait! There's more! That's right, 
Whilst we could just sit on our ass and wait for the military to arrive, we have the small commitment of taking out every psychopath. Which brings us to Roger and Reed. Roger and Reed are professional virgins, <coughs> sorry, magicians, whose tricks match that of the box of magic equipment. You know, the one that you got for like Christmas or your birthday and you pretended you're really grateful for, then you keep it out for like a couple of weeks so your parents think you're using it. But the truth is it's still in the plastic wrapper and eventually it just gets shoved under the bed or in a cupboard somewhere. Then eventually you're clearing out your room like two years later and you find it again and decide to try it, but you can't find the instructions despite the box still being sealed. So everything's essentially useless and you just throw it all in the bin. So yeah, they're, they're not very good magicians. Whilst this battle could be dangerous under normal circumstances, this isn't the first time I've had a balding man wave his sword in my face as another man was exploding all over me. So I had a plan going into this. It's over, Anakin. I have the high ground. With height in my favour, we managed to sit on top of the Atlantica Ninja Octopus Path. Yes, that's the official name, and just obliterate both Roger and Reed without them being able to do any damage. Roger and Reed out of the way, we've officially taken out every optional psychopath in the game. And now, only need to focus on the main story, starting with the military coming in. Unfortunately, this saving grace doesn't last long as, just as the military are clearing up the Silver Strip, ominous green gas starts getting released from vents underneath Fortune City, mutating the zombies who then demolish our reinforcements. I thought there was no way this could get any worse, until I realised Rebecca, my lovely Rebecca, well she was in there too. I couldn't have her getting turned into a zombie, I had to go and save her, but that wasn't going to be easy. The mutated zombies have increased health, speed, and attack range as they projectile vomit all over you. I needed a way to avoid as many zombies as possible, which is where the underground 4x4s come in. They may not be the fastest, but they run over enemies and stop me getting hit long enough to get to Rebecca, who's being held hostage by Sergeant Boykin. I normally respect my elders and military personnel, and Boykin's both of those. But you know who I don't respect? Felons. That's right, this man is a criminal. I don't care if you've gone insane or you're mentally ill. You kidnapped someone. That's 20 years in prison and you have to face the law. And today, I am the law! Much like the American military, my plan for this was to throw as much firepower as possible at the enemy until they die. Unfortunately for me, that was Boykin's plan as well. And he had frag grenades, so you can imagine how that's going to go. However, those frag grenades were going to be his undoing, as I quickly realised we can just pick them up. And as he always throws them at my feet, that wasn't a problem, so after not too long, we shoot Boykin down. With Boykin out of the way, we now need to get Rebecca back to the safe house, and with her injuries, this wasn't going to be easy. I mean, unless of course you just so happen to prepare for this part of the game from the very beginning, by gambling for $500,000, buying the sports car, and then picking up the vehicle magazine to give your 4x4 three times health to ensure it wouldn't be destroyed as you were driving down the strip. Oh, wait. When we get back to the safe house, we can't relax for too long, as zombies have breached the bulkhead doors. We battle through tooth and nail, using every last bullet and every gun, every queen we pick up along the way, and even the equipment we need to close the doors, until finally we secure the safe house. But it's not over yet. We now need to investigate the source of the green gas, so we head back underground and discover a hidden facility where all of the zombies appear to be hoarding. When I look further, it appears there are armed guards murdering the zombies and harvesting the queens. But that's the least of our worries, as they now want to harvest my internal organs and turn them into external organs. Which, let's be honest, won't be very useful to me. Whilst we've fought many armed enemies before, this is potentially the toughest non-boss group of enemies so far. Not because of the number of enemies or the weapons they have, but because Chuck is as ambidextrous as Alex Brooker. In all of our other battles, we've been able to safely reposition ourselves, but our only option here was to either go all guns blazing and try and take them out, or to make a run for it and get to the other side. I tried hundreds of times and failed every single one. Time and time again, I find myself getting shot by one of the four guards, and no matter what I tried, it was never enough. It got to the point where I was wondering, is this even possible? Did Capcom ever want anyone to beat this game without taking damage? Was this just their mean joke to anyone willing to attempt this insane task? They let you get this far in the game just to bend you over and give you a prostate massage? But then I thought, if this was their cruel joke, why would they spawn me behind a wall? They put cover here for a reason. 
They know this is at least somewhat possible. And no matter how many attempts it takes, I'm going to do this. We soldiered on, sniping down enemy after enemy until finally... <sighs> we've done it. Right. Right. I, I serpentine. I'm, gonna, I'm pushing right here. The LMG definitely does enough damage to do this. It's just... I need to not be shot first. Oh, I'm so good. With the guards down and the scientists defeated, we grab the laptop and make our way back to the safe house. Once we open the laptop, we see that the zombie outbreak was all planned. An elaborate ruse to harvest queens which can be used in the manufacture of Zombrex. Big Pharma was sacrificing entire cities so they could line their pockets and make more money. But with Rebecca, we had enough evidence to bring them down. No! And with that, not only did Sullivan stab me in the back, he plunged a knife through my heart. I tried to retaliate, but he gets away with the laptop and all of our evidence. We have to take him down. We chase after him to the Yucatan Casino and make our way to the roof where he admits he orchestrated the outbreak to gather queens and that the death of Chuck's wife and the population of Fortune City were acceptable losses. And with that, Sullivan had to die. No one was going to call Chuck's wife, who I've never met and have no emotional connection to, an acceptable loss. Despite Sullivan being a more security guard, this man was our biggest threat so far, with rolling kicks, three-piece combos, a handgun for ranged attacks and the support of an enemy AC-130 above. Sullivan could beat the shit out of us without even trying. And unfortunately, if we failed, it wasn't as simple as just walking to him and trying again. We had to fight our way through a horde of hundreds of zombies before we could even get to him. Hundreds of zombies that would use all of our ammo and break our weapons. We tried everything. Shotguns, snipers, drop kicks, leg sweeps, even the trusty LMG that had managed to take out almost every boss so far. Nothing seemed to do the trick. But I had come this far, and I wasn't going to give up. So we get back in their elevator and try again, and again, and again, until finally we land on a tactic. A tactic that has been 15 years in the making, taking me back to my time on Rust. Quick scoping. The damage the sniper puts out is second to none. I knew this was going to be the only way we can take him down, so we drop kick him for a stun and then hit a quick scope over and over and over and then. Let's go! Come on! Ugh. Brother, ugh. With Sullivan down, we contact Channel 6 News and go to escape them all. But just as we're about to leave, we get a phone call. It turns out TK has kidnapped not only my daughter, but also Stacy. To get my daughter back, and Stacy, I guess, but I, I don't really care about her, we make our way around them all, doing errands for TK. Picking up photos, champagne, queens, a lab suit, a USB drive, a mobile headset, and a gift basket. And with all of that collected, we make our way to the arena where we get ambushed. God knows what TK does to our voluptuous unconscious bodies, but he does take all of our weapons, meaning this entire battle will have to be done hand to hand. With only the limited amount of moves unlocked, we have to use what's here to take out TK and beat Dead Rising 2 without taking damage. TK has a range of attacks from using his mace, submachine gun, or even just charging at you to do damage. So we have to keep our distance whilst trying to deal damage and stopping Katie and Stacy from being eaten by zombies. Which is when it came to me. What if we use Spitfire? Much like the quick step we used to take out Randy, the Spitfire is a mixed drink which gives us extra skills. And whilst we can't take them into the battle, any drinks we use before we get ambushed will carry through to the battle. So we run to the Americana Casino, mix our drink and head back to TK. Which is when I realise I made a quick step. For f sake. Oh well, it took me like an hour to get that drink. We're going with it. With our increased speed, we're able to dodge TK's initial charge attack and rebuttal with a drop kick and a forward kick, bringing TK to a stun and causing him to run away, giving us time to bring Stacy and Katie 
back away from the zombies. We continue this plan of dodge, drop kick, dodge, drop kick, dodge, drop kick, and finally, a dodge and a drop kick. Taking out TK, saving Katie and Stacy for the perfect ending, and completing the challenge. Thank you very much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.